Welcome to Marvelous Videos. I'm Rylan, and this is The Thing Anthology Stories, Questionable Research. We already tracked down The Thing's history from 1121 AD to the immediate events after 1982 in an earlier video. To give you a brief summary, the story of The Thing started with the comic The Northman Nightmare, in which a group of Vikings stumble upon The Thing and manage to bury it under the ice. Thousands of years later, and after two live-action films, the 1991 comic The Thing from Another World revives McCready and takes him on an adventure against a new thing that was assimilated with a U.S. Marine. Then came The Thing from Another World, Climate of Fear, in which The Thing went to an Argentinian base, and McCready was present there to save the day once again, with the help of others. However, the 1993 comic The Thing from Another World, Eternal Vows, went a step ahead and placed The Thing in a bustling island town, and McCready followed suit. However, the comic we are going to discuss today Questionable Research serves as a sequel to the 1982 film, while disregarding the continuity of the other books, and that's the reason why we thought of diving deep into this marvelous comic in a separate video. So, buckle up, and let's take a closer look at this story in which a group of scientists come to retrieve the biomatter of the frozen alien after US Outpost 31 was incinerated. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Part 1. Another helicopter reaches what used to be US Outpost 31. And this time, it's no Norwegian chopper with American military men, but a team of researchers. All that remains now is the charred remains of the outpost, and several frozen things spread across the length and breadth of the station. The team leader, Douglas, divides the men and women into two groups. While one of them goes to salvage information and data, the other is tasked with gathering biomatter from the remains of the things. As they lay their eyes on the alien symbiote for the first time, horror and shock fills them. Hooper was carrying one of the bigger ones into the chopper, but he mishandled the frozen body and a part of its finger cracked and detached. Although the snapped part did come on board, the team didn't know about the incident. As is the norm with most of the Thing comics, one small mistake turns into a massive butterfly effect that threatens the existence of humanity itself. The Thing's size wasn't what had bothered Hooper. He was rather worried about the concept of it, and the process that the alien applied to seek control of its organisms. It was very natural for Hooper to think this way, who wouldn't be worried about an alien that could shapeshift into your friends, and after the assimilation was done, sought to kill anyone around, and then reproduce? Nevertheless, Douglas was a sensible man, and an able leader. He comforted Hooper, by saying that he shouldn't worry as the thing will become completely harmless once they reach their research vessel base, Donacek. But Douglas was not entirely bereft of worry and concern, as he wished that his wife Barbara and his assistant Arlene didn't take so long to find the information and records that they were looking for. Luckily, it wasn't long before the two returned, and the research crew left the place en route to Donacek. Barbara and Douglas talk about each other's exploits on the helicopter, when Barbara revealed how her search was productive. She had found someone's side notes and videotapes, but the most important discovery was a simulator module and notes on simulation and other infection tests. The man who backed up this valuable piece of data was smart enough to safeguard it, in such a place that it survived the explosion and subsequent destruction of Outpost 31. Furthermore, she found an audio log of another member of US Outpost 31, safely locked up in a drawer. It should come as no surprise to fans from the movie that the audio log was from none other than McCready. Barbara and Douglas seem to be very excited about the entire discovery, with little regards towards the men who lost their lives. This fact didn't go unnoticed by Hooper who didn't believe Barbara and Douglas talked about the situation the way they did. When Douglas asked what it was he was going on about, Hooper said, Like it's some kind of cutesy critter, and the way you talk about those men, I mean, they're dead. For God's sake, can't we at least show them a little respect? They reached their destination, and it was time to unload the creature and transfer it into a nitrogen tank. If you remember, John Carpenter's film had an all-male cast, and the subsequent prequel and comics incorporated females. Questionable research follows suit and has several female characters, including Marion, who appears to have a little crush on Douglas, 
causing Barbara to dislike her. Meanwhile, the finger thing grows legs from one of its ends and begins to explore the area and find prey. It manages to target an unwitting rat and assimilates with it. The rat thing then went on to uncover a crew member of Donacek. It revealed its true nature and several tentacles that ended in maws that came out of the rat thing. Part 2. The second part of the comics begins with the crew of the Donacek running the latest of their experiments on the thing by giving it an innocent rabbit. It turns out that the crew is defrosting small parts of the thing that they brought with them and are now trying to let it integrate with several animals in order to learn as much as possible about its physiology. However, they don't let the process of assimilation complete and they freeze the thing with liquid nitrogen just before it can complete its shape-shifting. With every experiment that they conduct, they increase the assimilation duration just a bit. While this current experiment with the poor rabbit is taking place, Barbara listens to the audio log of R.J. McCready. Marion was one of the scientists working on the Donacek, who was going through Blair's data. She concludes that while Blair's data was very good, it didn't take into consideration warmer temperatures. According to Marion, it wouldn't be more than 3,000 hours for international catastrophe if the thing was ever introduced to a population in a temperate climate. Furthermore, she believes that it is only in the first 100 hours that humanity would ever have a chance to fight back and avert global assimilation. And past that point, all fauna would get wiped off the face of the Earth. So, if by some chance the crew of the Donacek was not careful enough, they would be responsible for worldwide loss of life. Hooper gets further paranoid and panicky about the figures that Marion just presented, and he implores Douglas to take the matter a little more seriously. Cooper suggests that the original experiment must be stopped right away, and tries to speak to Douglas with reason and rationale. He realizes that the thing is nothing less than a time bomb, patiently waiting to explode and invade all of Earth. But Douglas doesn't seem to share Hooper's thoughts. Hooper tells him that as humans, they are bound to make mistakes, and one such mistake could cost a lot more than anyone can imagine. He believes that they should not only stop their work at Donacek, but also return to US Outpost 31, to ensure that none of the things remain in existence. Douglas didn't take Hooper's advice very well, and sort of asked him to pick up his morals and throw them into the sea. According to him, there's no room for morals in research. Morals cloud judgment. Morals taint conclusions. Morals define unwanted prejudices. Hooper insults Douglas by saying that the latter has thrown his common sense out the window. Douglas retorts and tells Hooper that he wouldn't be on board Donacek if not for him. Hooper has had enough by now and slaps Douglas. They get into a physical brawl and knock down a case that contained the frozen thing from their latest experiment. This part ended in a fantastic cliffhanger, but the more exciting aspect was the character development between Hooper and Douglas. They don't just bring to fore their respective lines of thinking, but also reflect the two essential aspects of any scientific development. Douglas believed that this was the find of a century and wanted to learn more about it to help humanity have a better fighting chance against the thing. But, as Gandhi once said, if one takes care of the means, the end will take care of itself. So, although the end of Douglas's actions might remain good, his means to reach that end were not. Part 3 the crew of the Donacek immediately got into action. After the box containing the frozen thing broke, Douglas asked Hooper for some hand gloves, which he distributed among the others. They picked up the frozen biomatter of the thing before it could thaw and refroze them. However, Marion's research showed that even a single cell of the thing could lead to infection and subsequent assimilation. The thing's cells travel through blood, which is the most potent vector because it feeds every cell in the body with oxygen. The cells may transfer into the bloodstream through minor cuts and bruises, and the victim could never know. Meanwhile, a crew member named Carl finds a makeshift spaceship in Donacek's hangar. To his surprise, Arlene was building the spaceship from spare helicopter parts that she salvaged on the Donacek. As you may already know, the thing doesn't reveal its natural and visceral form until the time its cover blows up. However, Carl had seen the spaceship and Arlene's thin cover was now exposed. It is important to note here that the Arlene thing came into being by the rat thing that infected a crew member at the end of the first part of the comic. Arlene thing revealed its monstrous and tentacled body to Carl and attacked him. Everything happened so quickly that Carl could not even call for help. In the intervening period, the researchers in the lab realized that Carl and Arlene were missing from the spot and were not tested. Douglas, being Douglas, 
said that there was no need to test them, as they were nowhere near the mishap. However, at that very instant, they heard a couple of gunshots coming from the hangar. Marion, Douglas, and Hooper go there to investigate and find that their greatest fear has come to life. The thing was out of its frozen nitrogen chamber. Our lean thing was assimilated with Carl, who must have fired the shots. Hooper blamed Douglas for what had happened in a fit of rage and went on to attack him, but this was a fatal mistake that sealed Hooper's fate because he had turned his back on the Arlene thing. She charged on him with her long, sharp tentacles, and Hooper became what he feared the most. Marion and Douglas free from this spot and reached the lab but find it empty. Not only were Barbara and the other scientists missing, but all the samples were gone as well. As we had mentioned earlier, it is always one small mistake that leads to elegant mishaps in the Thing's world. Hooper was the one who was not careful enough while transporting the body of the Thing in Part 1. He managed to break a splinter off of it, and that's what led to the Rat, and later Arlene, getting contaminated. Part 4 Douglas starts calling out to Barbara, but she's nowhere to be found. Marion tells him that their priority right now should be to find a safe location so that they can plan their future actions. But before they are able to do that, Arlene bursts through the deck and attacks Marion before assimilating with her. Douglas counters by tossing a vat of liquid nitrogen onto the alien and runs away. As he was trying to escape, he ran into his wife, Barbara, who accused him of being a thing. To prove his innocence, Douglas took out one of the portable testing kits and showed his blood not fighting the heat generated by it. Barbara claims that it was the other scientist, Tamara, who was the thing, and Barbara was forced to kill her. It now seems that Douglas and Barbara are the only survivors. Barbara suggests leaving the place immediately, and Douglas agrees. Before they can get into the chopper, Douglas gets hold of the flare gun and points it at her, insisting that she take the test. She tries to rescue herself from it, but Douglas knows better than that. Barbara took the test and it turned out to be a thing. She then transformed into a massively monstrous creature and tried to assimilate with Douglas, who escaped and chopped the helicopter's fuel tank. The resultant explosion destroyed Barbara Thing and started a huge fire in the donut check. Douglas realized that the fire would soon reach the fuel tanks of the vessel, and so didn't waste any time looking for a lifeboat. He threw himself into the sea before it could blow up. All alone in the water and clinging to some debris, Douglas speaks to a seagull and tells it how he wouldn't survive more than 20 minutes in the harshly cold waters. But to his utter horror, he notices the red eyes of the seagull and notices that the thing has infected it. As the seagull flew into the sky, Douglas lay there in the water, presumably waiting to succumb to the chilling waters. The man was clearly the creator of his own doom. The situation would have been very much different if only he had listened to Hooper and his warnings. Douglas almost wanted to play God and experimented on something that he didn't even understand. This particular thing is an organism that has existed in the universe for millions and millions of years. Who knows how ancient its species might be. The Marvelous Comic Review Questionable research started off very strong in terms of its setting and character development. We get to see some very authentic and realistic arguments on the way scientists carry out experiments and how Douglas behaved like a not-so-crazy yet mad scientist. He had no regard for the repercussions of his actions, but Hooper, on the other hand, was a sentimental man who failed to really convince Douglas, or really anyone for that matter, about stopping. While the love triangle was a bit unnecessary, the story itself is pretty efficient as a standalone sequel, and it wouldn't hurt seeing something of this sort as an episode of The Thing TV show. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.